everywhere you go, everyone you meet, all they talk about is this depression. They blame it on the war, they blame it on Wall Street, on politics and this administration. For two years now we've been assured good times are on the way. I wonder how much longer we must hear them talk this way. Prosperity is just around the corner. What we'd like to know is which corner. We've turned so many corners now we're dizzy. But still I'm positive we'll soon be busy. Why, I read in Monday's paper where 10,000 men were hired. Yes, but Tuesday they forgot to say 12,000 more were fired. But I insist this land of ours is stable. Stable? Sounds like horses to me. It was the Depression and election year of 1932. In just three years, America had been rocked off its foundations. The stability and prosperity of the 20s were gone, replaced by fear and hunger. And you couldn't even get a legal glass of beer to take the edge off a world gone crazy. You might not have enough to eat, yet you saw farmers on the newsreels dumping milk because they couldn't afford to bring it to market. It was the rainy day you'd been saving your money for, but your money was suddenly all gone because the bank had closed its doors. In the words of a popular depression song, you can't go to the poor house because the beds have all filled up with millionaires and because the poor house was the White House now. The man in the White House wasn't hungry, but he was as fearful as any American of losing his job. Herbert Hoover was being personally blamed for the Great Depression. I was playing with a little girl on the Maypole rings and suddenly her mother came and snatched her away and said, you can't play with her. She's responsible for your father losing his job. He was an unlikely villain. The name Hoover had been synonymous with humanitarian. He had made his reputation during the Great War. For the starving nation of Belgium, caught between German trenches and a British blockade, Hoover orchestrated shipments of food. Hoover kitchens, the relief stations were called. But he had no craving for fame and power. Hoover always claimed he was a public servant, not a politician. I told him one time, you know less about politics than any man that ever sat in the White House. And he didn't dispute it. This rare home movie footage shows the real Hoover, a man who preferred fishing with his granddaughters to the trappings of wealth and power. Nevertheless, his humanitarian fame and progressive politics put him in demand. In 1928, he was the overwhelming choice to succeed Calvin Coolidge in the White House. Hoover assumed the office, but not the $75,000 a year salary. He never took one dime, one red cent as president. He turned it all back in the treasury because he had money. It was the height of the economic boom. Hoover appeared ready to preside over an unrivaled time of prosperity in America. And yet he had personal misgivings about uncontrolled speculation on Wall Street. He liquidated most of his own stocks at the peak of the bull market. Hoover was one of the few to get out in time. There were other signs of distress in the land. Farming had been in a slump since the end of the Great War. In the cities, assembly lines were humming at substantial human cost. It was the age of the infamous speed up. Even the elite noticed a kind of spiritual bankruptcy in America. In his essay, The Jazz Age, F. Scott Fitzgerald told of the epidemic of suicide among his friends. 
the good life, it seemed, was not good enough to live for. Then came Tuesday, October 29th, 1929, Black Tuesday. The tremendous crowds which you see gathered outside the stock exchange are due to the greatest crash in the history of the New York Stock Exchange. My mother gambled on the stock market, so she always asked me to call up saint Fal, which was the broker, and ask them for the quotation, the stock market quotations. So I call again that one afternoon, and I didn't remember from one day to the next what the quotations were, and I quoted the figures to her, and she faded dead away on the bed. When I arrived in New York after the crash, I found a city of very bewildered people. They were bewildered, they were frightened, and they were in shock. Some people thought the crash was an opportunity. Suddenly, stocks were cheap. Now is the time to buy. I hope you have plenty of the wherewithal to wade in and buy. But not long after Black Tuesday, many stocks were about as valuable as wallpaper. I remember looking with considerable interest at one room in a Chicago club where members took stocks that went to nothing and pasted them on the wall as a souvenir of the Depression. The demand for goods vanished. Assembly lines ground to a halt. And crops rotted in the field because they weren't worth the price of picking. In response to the emergency, President Hoover cut income taxes. It was little help when the tax on an average salary of $4,000 was less than $6 per year. But otherwise, he believed government should leave the economy alone. It would heal itself. Prosperity, he predicted, was just around the corner. That kind of advice had seen Americans through recessions for more than 100 years. But this time, they weren't buying it. Americans turned on the president with a vengeance. The town that I lived in was a Republican town. And even there, you found a breakthrough of people getting disenchanted with President Hoover. It is one of the ironies, one of the tragedies, in fact, of Hoover's career, that this instinctively progressive man, who had a sense of government uh, as an intervening authority, although a limited, more limited sense than his successor, it's a, it's a real irony that he would be, Hoover would be perceived as a conservative reactionary president. Having identified a scapegoat, the country now set about adopting a hero. He would be everything that Herbert Hoover was not, a Democrat, an aristocrat, a consummate politician, a role that Franklin Delano Roosevelt was born to play. He had it, he had charm, charisma. He just caught on. I don't mean caught on like a movie star or a rock star today. No, 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 no. We don't experience any more politicians who catch on. Well, FDR caught on. Something else was catching on in the early 1930s, a bizarre fad that in many ways mirrored this most unusual time in America, marathon dancing. By 1932, one in four Americans was out of work. Desperate for a way to pass the time, people embraced a desperate form of entertainment, one that could last as long as nine months. Marathon dancing had been around since the early 20s. Back then, it was part of the craze to establish endurance records. Gertrude Utterly swam the English Channel. There were tree sitters, people who sat in trees. There were flagpole sitters. Some man pushed a peanut up Pike's Peak with his nose. I mean, people were trying to express, you know, what is the limit of, of the human body as a machine. 
At first, dancers moved non-stop to recorded music for more than 24 hours at a time. But promoters soon found a way of extending the contests indefinitely by changing the rules. By the Depression, those rules were generally 45 minutes of dancing and 15 minutes of rest, 24 hours a day, round the clock. And they feed you seven times a day on a table that rolls out on the floor. So you can eat seven times. I thought, gee, they feed you. That was pretty good. During the Depression, marathon dancing took on a whole new character. It became hugely popular. People looking for cheap entertainment found it at the dance halls. 25 cents to get in, a dollar a night, and you could stay for hours. It became far more than an endurance contest. Marathon dances evolved into live soap operas, heated dramas of romance, survival, and danger, and full of gimmicks to keep the customers coming back. At one marathon, a man hung upside down for several days. There was something called Frozen Alive in which a contestant would volunteer to be entombed in a huge block of ice. And this was all dramatized. The promoter would go up to the ice and hold the microphone against it and say, you know, are you frozen yet? Can you still breathe? And of course, the contestant would have a flashlight and, and signal with the light. The most popular promotion was a wedding staged on the dance floor. The lucky couples were thrown lavish ceremonies complete with, in this case, cellophane gowns. Some of these weddings were legitimate, but by no means all. Sometimes they were married by real ministers and had to get a divorce, and sometimes they weren't. Polite society was scandalized by dance marathons, suspecting that the prizes were rigged, as they often were, and that more than resting was going on during the breaks as it often was. One contestant, Stan West, told me that he loved to seduce women in the audience and that he would try to get them to go outside with him for 15 minutes during his rest break instead of going to the, to the boys' quarters. Fortunately or unfortunately, it was a very quick event. Unfazed, the fans kept on coming back to the dance halls. They became a haven for out-of-work entertainers. Red Skelton was an MC for a time when vaudeville dried up. Jazz diva Anita O'Day performed for the first time at a marathon. And I just said, I know a tune called The Lady in Red. Do you think I could sing it some night, you know? And they let me sing The Lady in Red. And the people in the audience throw money on the floor. Everybody helps pick it up to put it in your pocket, take it in the back room, put it in your suitcase, and you're beginning to save your money. You're beginning to learn to sing with the band. Then there were those who danced out of hunger. Food was plentiful, six or seven meals a day, and contestants got a place to sleep, if only for 15 minutes at a time. Popular couples would find local sponsors. Audience members would throw coins at their favorite dancers. This was called a silver shower. Well, it's money, you put it in the pocket, you put it in the drawer in the back, and by the time you leave, you got a hundred bucks in change. <laughs> and of course, there was the prize money, a thousand dollars or more that awaited the last couple on their feet. The lure of the prizes and sometimes the fear of a return to homelessness kept the dances going on for months at a time. The longest in Chicago lasted from August 1930 to April 1931, more than nine months. Deep into a marathon, it became surreal. Dancers actually asleep on their feet and suffering hallucinations. Going squarely, it was called. Like the weddings, it was often feigned. Contestants very soon learned that spectators liked the idea of kind of temporary madness. So at one show, a man was picking daisies as if he was in a field. I think the line between what was performed and what was in fact really going on was often very blurry. In the fall of 1932, an intricate dance of a different kind was winding down, and it was plain to see who would drop by the wayside. Our party can truly feel that we have held the faith. Herbert Hoover had stood by his guns throughout the crisis. 
It was old-time individualism, not the government, that would see the nation clear. Deficit spending was unthinkable, as was welfare, even if the people were hungry. Hoover didn't sugarcoat this bitter medicine. He didn't seem to mind if he was unpopular, as long as he was correct. He became an easy target for a master politician. It is true that the toes of some people are being stepped on and are going to be stepped on. But these toes belong to the comparative few. FDR had a very particular approach to politics, quite unique, very different from today's politicians and very different from most politicians before him. He enjoyed it. He enjoyed the game. He saw it as a game, played it as a game. You have nominated me. Unlike Hoover, Franklin Roosevelt did not write his own speeches, but the power of the voice behind the borrowed words was electrifying. I pledge myself to a new deal for the American people. He may have been speaking to hundreds of thousands of people, but the young people thought that he was talking directly to them. I make it almost sound mystical, and it almost was. I remember going once to a soldier's field in Chicago where there were thousands and thousands of people there. And when he made his talk, he was talking to me. For all the infatuation with FDR, there were those who hated him passionately, especially members of his own social class. FDR was considered a traitor to his class and spoken of in that way. He's a traitor to us and we are better than those other people is basically what they're saying. While FDR provoked strong emotions in voters, President Hoover seemed cold and distant. For the first time, these surface impressions were carried to a mass audience via radio and newsreels. The result, in November, was a landslide victory for FDR and the Democrats. During the four months between the election and the inauguration, the Depression worsened, and the political differences between FDR and Hoover turned into bitter personal hostility. Hoover tried to draw Roosevelt into a cooperative effort to relieve the emergency, but the president-elect refused. He was saving his ammunition. Hoover ignored the convention of dining with the Roosevelts at the White House. He invited them to an afternoon tea instead. Feeling snubbed, FDR declined the invitation. By the time he exited the White House for the last time as president, Hoover was barely on speaking terms with Roosevelt. So when they rode from the White House to the Capitol, you get these photographs and this marvelous cartoon showing the smiling FDR, confident, and Hoover just as Glum. I mean, you, you couldn't tell the difference between where his crumpled top hat was and his face began. An atmosphere of petty rancor on a bleak day in Washington that was punctuated by ringing words from the Capitol steps. So first of all, let me assert my firm belief that the only thing we have to fear is fear itself. We have nothing to fear but fear itself. This was probably one of the great statements and misstatements of all time. If he wanted to put it more accurately, he would have added, but there is a lot to fear. Nonetheless, the mood of the country was energized, gone were the dismal days of government inertia. But it would be some time before the change at the top would make any difference to the man in the street. He wasn't looking toward the White House for relief from the Depression. 